It's an honor to have uh, Professor Michael Berry from Bristol University today. Sir Michael, you are going to tell us about chaos quantum number. We are all very impatient to hear you about this. Thank you. Pleasure to be part of this meeting. Thank you, Joe, for organizing it. The three parts of the talk are in the title. That's the summary. <laughs> chaos, well, we heard about it al already uh, this morning. There's an old English dictionary which defines chaos as a confused heap of mingle mangle. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to tell you one thing about it, which is that Newtonian physics is not deterministic. Newtonian mathematics is deterministic. I want to explain the difference. Now, if you have isolated objects with forces between them, the outcome is indeed uniquely determined by the initial state. And we know, we heard this morning, any initial uncertainty can grow slowly. For example, if you have planets uh, over short time scales, that's regular motion, or quickly, for example, pinball machines, that's chaotic uh, motion. Now, here's a little toy, you may have seen it. It's my counterpart of what uh, uh, Chris showed us this morning, um, a conical pendulum, which may or may not have little magnets on the bottom. If it doesn't, the motion is regular. It's motion under gravity, with this rosette pattern. If you have uh, magnets there repelling, the competition between their repulsion and gravity gives you uh, chaos. Well, we heard enough about that this morning. But still, is it determined in principle? Well, mathematically, yes, but physically not, uh, because isolation would violate physics. Why? Well, you can't screen out gravity. So uh, claiming perfect isolation isn't Newtonian physics. OK, this has consequences. Here you have molecules in a gas in a box. Uh, they bounce around under their mutual influence. I'm thinking of them classically. Now, of course, there are perturbations from outside. What's the weakest perturbation I can think of? Take the gravity from an electron at the observable limit of the universe, <laughs> 10 to the 10 light years away. Well, you don't know where it is. Its gravity affects the molecules differently. As I say, you don't know where it is. And that introduces uncertainty, which is magnified by this convexity. And you can ask, after how many collisions is the emergent direction uncertain by 90 degrees? You can call that loss of predictability. Well, the answer is um, about 50. It takes place in a nanosecond or so. So. Um, incredible sensitivity to initial conditions. By the way, if you're a billiards player, your gravity around the billiard table would make the billiard ball direction uncertainty uncertain after about 10 collisions. No billiards player can reliably plan a shot of more than about two collisions. Well, is it possible in principle? We heard about Laplace if we could know where every particle in the universe is? Well, the answer is no, because that would include the particles in the computers doing our calculations or in our heads. And that gives rise to contradictions. So even in principle, this Laplace's idea uh, doesn't hold true in Newtonian mechanics when you, have, uh, when you have chaos. So classical physics is not deterministic, classical uh, Mathematics, of course, is. Right, quantum. The quantum world is utterly different in many ways. You have discrete energy levels for an isolated system. It's indeterministic, but in a different way from what I've just described. The unpredictability of radioactive decay doesn't seem to originate in influences from distant objects. You have the wave nature of matter. You have you have a, a result which is in an isolated system, there is no chaos. I can't describe that to you, it will take too long, but it's to do with the fact that there are discrete energy levels which um, inhibit the, uh, the, uns the sensitivity with which initial quantum states would, would, uh, would evolve. 
And that's why I always call the subject quantum chaology, not quantum chaos. Chaology uh, uh, meaning what are the reflections of classical chaos in a corresponding quantum system. It's not chaos itself. Chaology, if you, if you look in the big Oxford dictionary, with rare words they um, list the number of times that they've found occurrences of those words, like rare three. Well, chaology is rare zero. And I asked the creator of the in online version of the Oxford English Dictionary, what that means. And it says, it means we only found it in earlier dictionaries. Okay. <laughs> um, now, there's a new fundamental constant, of course, Planck's constant, usually written like this. It's, it's rather small in everyday units, so units are units of angular momentum, 10 to the minus, oh, 10 to the minus, I didn't put it there, 10 to the minus th uh, 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 30 something, sorry. So, excuse, anyway, very tiny. Now, we have a correspondence principle. Quantum mechanics must reduce to classical mechanics in the limit when Planck's constant is negligible. Zero, we call it. Negligible compared to other quantities with this, of the same type. Well, that's correct, but it conceals a lot more than it reveals for a reason which is my central point. I'll get to it. It's an example of something more general, how different levels of description are related to each other. Statistical mechanics in, of matter reduces to thermodynamics in the limit of many, that's a particle number. Philip Anderson beautifully wrote about this, more is different, all kinds of difficulties arise with that limit. In fluids, viscous flow reduces to slippery flow as the viscosity goes to zero. Many problems still not understood about that. It involves turbulence. In light, wave optics reduces to ray optics as the wavelength goes to zero. And, and of course, we have this uh, example of quantum mechanics. Now, there are two ways of thinking about this uh, uh, difficulty of, of, of taking limits, and they're both oversimplified. One is, are these incompatible descriptions? I'm, uh, adapting a phrase of, uh, of, of S. Stephen Jay Gould, are they non-overlapping magisteria, not to be mixed? Or, in a beautiful old English word used by E.O. Wilson, should we seek conciliance between these different levels? They are, I'm more sympathetic with the second, but they both have their place. Now, co common to these correspondences is that they involve mathematical limits. Now, in almost every case, discordance is associated with the fact that these limits are mathematically singular. It's a fundamental mathematical phenomenon central to this understanding of differences between levels. Now, a singular limit needs explanation, and I'm going to give you a very simple example. Bite into an apple. If you uh, see a maggot, you're unhappy. If you see half a maggot, <laughs> you're even more unhappy. A quarter of a magnet, maggot, more unhappy still. Take the limit. If you see no maggot at all, you should be infinitely unhappy. <laughs> but of course you're not. It's a singular limit. The limit of smaller and smaller maggot fractions, infinite unhappiness, is different, discordant with the limit of no maggot at all. You're happy. You continue eating the apple. So common language, simple example of a singular limit. Now, this perspective enables two insights which are qualitatively different. One is reassurance to show that the old theory emerges from the deeper one, usually not straightforwardly, but you know it must happen. When you pr program a spacecraft to go to the moon, you don't write the Schrodinger equation and treat the, uh, the spacecraft uh, 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 as a wave packet. Of course, you don't need to do that. So you know that in some sense you will regain classicality, not trivial. And the other is there's a creative aspect because I, it leads you to identify qualitatively new phenomena inhabiting the borderlands between, uh, the, between the two levels. Now let's look at the reassurance, quantum to classical. The simplest possible case, take two oppositely directed beams of particles or beams of light. Here they are. Now, when they overlap, the intensity is doubled. Two flashlights 
are twice as bright as one, the mathematics is one plus one equals two. You may know that formula. Um, now, but of course, if you have waves, which deep down you know that you do have them, that's different. The intensity is the square of an interference amplitude. One plus one is not equal to two. Intensity can be anything between zero and four. Now, the limit is when the wavelength goes to zero. It's the same in quantum mechanics. So the oscillation gets faster and faster when it goes to zero. And the limit is very singular, anything between zero and four. Well, you know that beyond a certain point, the wavelength is too small to resolve, or the delicate coherence leading to this nice pattern is destroyed by external influences, and you see only the average. Well, the average is, in fact, two. So, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is restored by something we call decoherence. Now, I'm not being pretentious when I say that 1 plus 1 is not equal to 2. As pure mathematics, it's of course a very simple formula. Even though, if you know Russell and Whitehead's Principia Mathematica, 1 plus 1 equals 2 appears only halfway through volume 2 as the first non-trivial example of their mathematics, but still, it's, it's, it's as pure mathematics, it's simple. But this is applied mathematics, and you have to understand with any piece of mathematics, if you want to talk about it in connection with the world, whether it actually corresponds. You know, two people get together, produce a child. One plus one equals three. Two raindrops come down the windscreen of your car and coalesce. One plus one equals one. You have to know when it applies. It doesn't apply to wave intensities unless you introduce something external like decoherence, but still you have uh, uh, reassurance. Now this sensitivity to decoherence becomes more and more exquisite if you approach the classical limit in a case where there's classical chaos. And here's an example. Saturn's satellite Hyperion. It's a few hundred kilometers across this potato-shaped rock. It tumbles chaotically under the influence of the gravity of Saturn and some of its satellites. It's, it's roughly a period of about 13 days. Its uncertainty doubling time is about 100 days. Now, think of this as a quantum object. It has a quantum rotator, about 10 to the 60 planks in its angular momentum. Okay, and if it were isolated, any uncertainty would grow and get increasingly complicated in the relevant space until it reaches a scale of Planck's constant and then quantum mechanics can't see it anymore. And that's uh, after that Hyperion would reveal its quantum nature and the way it would happen, so I don't have time to explain it, but this energy uh, driven by these external, um, sorry, well-determined X gravity from satellites from Saturn would no longer increase. That has a name, it's called the quantum suppression of classical chaos. It's seen in, in molecular experiments, it, it exists. Well, when would that happen? Well, after about 40 years. It's a remarkably short time because of this chaos and uncertainty, and it's obviously nonsense. You don't look at Hyperion for 40 years and see its chaos suddenly stop or even gradually stop. The reason, of course, is that this suppression of chaos is an effect of extreme coherence requiring strict isolation. Of course, it isn't isolated. Um, a single visible photon from the sun, whose re-emission enables us to see it, has an energy of about 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's tiny compared to Hyperion's rotation energy, which is about 10 to the plus 19 joules, but it's huge compared to the energy separation of the energy levels of these different uh, 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 angular momentum quanta in Hyperion, which are about 10 to the minus 39 joules. Well, that means that the stream of photons from the sun their uncontrolled external influence completely destroys the quantum coherence in about 10 to the minus 53 seconds. Okay, so decoherence suppresses the quantum suppression of classical chaos and restores 
classicality. And that's why astronomers don't use quantum mechanics when they're describing uh, the motion of Hyperion. So that's the reassurance aspect. Right. Now the creativity aspect. Phenomena in the borderlands between the theories. There's an abundance of them in quantum physics. And I'll just tell you one. A quantum borderland phenomenon. The statistics of high excited energy levels. Well, one such statistic is the distribution of spacings between adjacent energy levels. So here's a spectrum of a molecule, for example. Here are the high excited states. Much molecular physics is concerned and atomic, with ground states, or the first few. But there's also interest in the high excited states. And these are intrinsically borderland because, first of all, they're quantum because you're talking about separate energy levels. But uh, high levels, you're near the classical limit. So we're in the regime that I'm drawing attention to. Here's a spacing S. You know the average spacing. Let's look at it through a microscope. So the average spacing is one. But individually, these spacings fluctuate. And the probability of spacing, P, probability of spacing, is what we're interested in. Now, there's a beautiful phenomenon. This spacing distribution, and I can see I can't spell, uh, exhibits universality. That means it doesn't matter what the system is, except for the type of chaology that it exhibits. Now, the first universality class, systems that are classically not chaotic and have more than one degree of freedom. Well, for example, take a circular drum, a circular um, uh, boundary, and it could be a quantum dot, for example, look at the excited states, it's the same problem mathematically as the frequencies of vibration of a circular drum. Well, here's the spacing distribution. Uh, this is the spacing distribution, curiously enough, but for a reason, that uh, uh, of these non-chaotic motions, is that this is the spacing distribution of random events. It's like waiting for a bus in Bristol. The most probable interval between two of them is actually zero. Right. Now, the second class is all systems that are classically chaotic and time reversible. This was shown by Chris, vibrations of a stadium, pull them apart, proven to be chaotic, completely different. There's the distribution. The energies actually repel each other. There's, uh, uh, there's a, a diminishing probability of getting smaller and smaller spacings. The third class is if you have systems that are classically chaotic and uh, and, and not time reversible. I should have said there's a mathematical theory called random matrix theory which describes this type of statistic. Um, the third class, classic chaotic and not time reversible, take a stadium, charge particle, put a magnetic field in it. it you get repulsion, but it's stronger, it, uh, it's quadratic at the origin. These are these three, there's another one, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, okay. Um, that also comes from random <coughs> matrix theory. So these are borderland phenomena in quantum uh, physics. Um, is one, one example of a class. There are many, many of them. Don't have time to describe more. Now, the third part, number. It seems completely different, but I'll explain the connection. Connections are very important in science. They're not optional extras. We're always delighted when we find apparently dis completely discordant areas uh, have similar structures. And we've seen a number of examples already today. I want to quote Charles Frank, my late colleague. Physics is not just concerning the nature of things, but concerning the interconnectedness of all the natures of things. And here's a provocative example. Apparently completely unrelated. Prime numbers, here they are. Um, I once, many years ago, uh, gave a talk including this aspect, and afterwards a young man came up to me and said, Professor, if you give this talk to mathematicians, I suggest you don't include 21 on your list. <laughs> well, I have learned. Um, well, they're the, the atoms of arithmetic, so one should know everything about them. Well, depict them as a staircase. That's the number of primes less than x. Jumps by one every time you encounter a prime. 
And there are infinitely many of them, but Euclid knew that. Uh, they thin out very slowly as you go higher, but they also fluctuate. Now, if you look at 10,000, you can't see the fluctuating. You see this beautiful, gently, slightly sloping, less than one um, curve. Well, well understood by mathematicians. But if you zoom in, uh, uh, you see these fluctuations, and one would like to understand them. They look random. They do have a structure, and uh, that structure is related to a set of different mathematical <coughs> numbers, which I won't explain exactly where they come from. They're called the Riemann zeros. And here are these, the first few of them, numerators, numbers. And again, there are infinitely many of them. The density of them increases slightly, slowly, as you go higher and higher. Now, there's an important unsolved mathematical problem called the Riemann hypothesis, one of the most important and frustrating, tantalizing mathematical problems today, which is that uh, these are all real numbers. If you want a physical or a common language understanding of the Riemann hypothesis, think of these numbers, oh, excuse me, sorry. We know the first 10 trillion are real. We know infinitely many of them are real. We know that at least 40% of them are real. But that's not a proof. There could be some ones that are not real. They would come in pairs very high up, but uh, nobody knows. Um, sorry, to, to make common language understanding of this, think of um, these numbers as frequencies. If they're real, they're definite frequencies. If they're complex, they're slightly blurred out. Think of any sequence with well-defined frequencies. Call it music. So the Riemann hypothesis says the primes contain music, four words. It's, uh, um, by the way, it's horrible if you play it. It sounds awful. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to play it now. But, but there, are, there are related sounds. I call this ear math. They're li listening to mathematics rather than seeing it. If they're related sounds, then, uh, system, then you do get interesting sounds, but not the primes themselves. Now, frequencies. Why have I said that? So there are strong hints from a mathematical analogy that the Riemann zeros have, are vibration frequencies or energy levels of some unknown quantum system in the third universality class. I want to show you the evidence for that. The spacings of these numbers near the 10 to the 20th beautifully fits random matrix theory, quantum chaos theory. Beautiful. But it goes wrong. If you go beyond the first few neighbors, random matrix theory fails. And here is a statistic that measures that very precisely. It's called the number variance. Imagine that you have a, you're looking up near these very high Riemann zeros and you take a stretch where on the average, when you know the average behavior, you should get a number L of them length. Of course, you won't every time, the number will fluctuate and the mean square deviation as a function of this separation is this quantity. Well, look, here it is. Random matrix theory predicts it grows in this way, but uh, the Riemann zeros, after the first few, well, we've already seen that that mathematics agrees, begin to deviate. Now, it turns out, it's a beautiful fact, that in quantum chaology, I didn't describe this, but this universality also fails for longer range statistics in ways that are well understood, related to the periodic orbits of the chaotic system. Chaotic systems, most orbits are not periodic, but some are, and we know about them. They're unstable, there are infinitely many of them, and it's their structure that causes the deviations. They're not universal, at least the short ones are not. Um, right, but the analogy with the Riemann zeros fails in exactly the same way with the periodic orbits of this unknown system replaced by individual primes. In fact, the periods of these periodic orbits that we dream of are multiples of logarithms of prime numbers. Well, we have a quantum theory of the deviation. Let's apply it to the Riemann 
zeros and uh, look at that function beyond the first few where you see that deviation. Look at the, the number variance. Look, random matrix theory. It's useless beyond a few, You're going up to 100. But here, and there are two curves that you can't see because they're so close together. One is the um, uh, Riemann zeros and the other is the quantum inspired analog theory. Very good. Well, let's continue this. Let's, let's look at uh, the, the 100 near half a million spacing. Well, there we are, still continues. By the way, these peaks here and previously, these peaks, we're talking about distributions of Riemann zeros near the 10 to the 20th, these peaks are actually related to the lowest Riemann zeros. It's a wonderful duality. It's a mathematical phenomenon called resurgence, which appears in many different areas. But this is an example of it. So this works. You know, it's evidence of the fertility of the analogy between um, arithmetic and uh, quantum chaology. But the basis of the analogy is this known unknown. That's the underlying quantum system and the chaotic classical dynamics underlying it. We know a lot about it. You know, I told you, periodic orbits we know. We know it's chaotic. It doesn't have time reversal symmetry, so it's analogous to a particle in a magnetic field. Um, we know that its chaos is uniform in the sense that wherever you look in the relevant space, the exponential divergence of trajectories of the system, we don't know what it is, will be uniform, will be the same. We know lots of properties, enough to apply this quantum analogy, but we don't know what the system is. And there are one or two mysterious loose ends which, uh, which don't quite fit. Okay, so the Riemann hypothesis could be false. You know, um, uh, a leading mathematician, I, I, he came to Bristol and as I drove him from the station, he said, why do you physicists uh, all believe in the Riemann hypothesis? And I said, I don't believe in it, I don't know. It will be more interesting, actually, if it were false, because there will be a reason why, um, uh, if I can express it uh, in a religious way, why, why God is so malicious as to tempt us into believing that... Uh, 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 it, it, that uh, uh, this real hypothesis is true, everything fits, but then at the last minute it would be wrong. Maybe, maybe that's the reason why it's so difficult, because it's not true. So it ain't over till it's over. Um, I finish with Pete Hine. Problems worthy of attack prove their worth by hitting back. <laughs> Thank you. Now, just let me, I, I want to say two things, first of all. First is, there are no stupid questions. But the second is, I don't hear very well, so I might ask Raya to, to translate what you say, so. They also need the microphone. Yes, please. Well, thank you for a splendid talk, but I would like to ask one simple question about the closing remarks. Would it be possible then to refute the Riemann hypothesis by making a kind of no-go theorem that there could not be a quantum system with all these uh, signatures that you briefly listed, such as the, uh, you know, the uh, the exponential divergence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, just the your question final was: could, could there be a quantum no-go theorem that, that no quantum, like Bell's theorem, no quantum theorem? I think not, because there's such a vast variety of different quantum systems. You know, we've looked at a lot of them, uh, Dirac equation and, uh, and renormalization, limits of, limits of Hamiltonians, of, uh, all kinds of things we've looked at. Um, so I, I find it hard to imagine that that could, you can't rule it out, but I, I, I don't think so. No, the easy way to... Uh, I mean, that would refute, well, the easy way to refute the analogy would be if the Riemann hypothesis were false. If you would find two, they would come in pairs, actually four, two above and two below. If you would find uh, this quadruplet of, uh, of zeros off the line, and uh, there's no suggestion of that yet. Yeah. It's not just a matter of numerics, by the way, because the numerics that is, is numerics combined with rigorous inequality, so you know they're on the line. It's not that you approximately they are. Okay. Question there, I give you the microphone. 
Thank you for this high provoking talk. Um, I would like to ask you if you can precise your definition of determinism, since you quote Laplace, in which determinism and predictability are conflated. Yes. And it seems to me that after Poincaré or Adamar or even Pierre Duhem, uh, we, we could try to separate in the definition determinism and predictability. Yes, so the, this was making precise this distinction of determinism and predictability. The point was to go beyond this now well understood distinction uh, and, and, to, and by the final element realizing that chaotic systems are so sensitive that uh, uh, you would need to know, as Laplace imagined, the position of every particle in the universe. But my point is that the gravity of those particles would include the gravity in the computers doing the calculations. So even logically, uh, you couldn't implement is in physics the determinism that you know exists in mathematics, even for chaotic systems. So that was the point. Yes, I see a question there. Can you please be careful? <coughs> um, Michael, I'm, go I'm going to sort of provoke you to make some more comments about um, the relationship between uh, chaos and quantum mechanics, because you drew a very strong line. You said, you know, isolated quantum systems are not chaotic. Um, and I want to do it by drawing on work that you yourself have done which is to make the point that if you take an ensemble of chaotic systems and study their, not their individual trajectories in state space, but the probability distribution that they satisfy, then you end up with actually a system described by a linear equation, which is the Louisville equation. Mm. And as you well know, it's very formally similar to the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics in many respects. Yeah. So just as we know and understand how chaotic dynamics might underpin, or does underpin in the classical sense, what looked like very sort of linear type probability distributions, do you think it's possible that something like this may also ultimately underpin quantum mechanics? In other words, there is some deterministic underpinning, the sort of thing that Einstein, of course, always believed was the case. You, with was, the analogy between the Louisville equation and, and, the, and chaotic. There, there are several bits to that, uh, that question, and of course I know the background in some of the work that you, you, that you have done. Um, one point which is often made, which you made, uh, which is that one of the reasons why um, uh, quantum, there's no chaos in quantum mechanics is that quantum Schrodinger equation is linear, and that's wrong because there's a counterexample of the Louisville equation. So if you take, you don't, don't need an ensemble, a single particle is a delta function, it evolves uh, precisely classically, it can have any amount of chaos that you like. So that's a mistake and that's why I didn't mention it, okay. Um, now you said that I drew a separation between the classical and quantum to do with the, it, when you have chaos, but then I deliberately blurred it by pointing out that as soon as you allow external influences which may be so weak that you would never think to include them in the dynamics. They do affect the quantum kinematics in the, in the sense that they uh, destroy the coherence that's characteristic of quantum and restore classicality. So that was the point. But thank you. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you for the talk. I was just wondering uh, why you, th like what underlies uh, why you think that there, there is this analogy between a quantum system and the Riemann hypothesis? So, like, what's your intuition for why? It comes from a formula. Um, the, 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 there's a formula in quantum physics for the uh, expressing the density of states of a quantum system in terms of classical periodic orbits. Now that is isomorphic, you just look at its structure, look at the formula without thinking of the meaning of its terms with something called the von Mangold formula for the, for the um, density, 
function of the, of the Riemann zeros. So there's an analogy, it has the same structure, it's the sum over certain oscillations with exponentially decaying amplitudes, and then you can identify term by term different bits of the quantum and the classical. Not enough, as I said, to tell you what the classical system is, we don't even know what the dimensionality of it is. I mean, if I can be provocative, it's probably a little bit more than one, whatever that means. Um, so, so, uh, so that's the basis. It's identifying two formulae which come from completely different intellectual areas, but which have the, a similar structure. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's Jim. And there's Jim Al-Khalili at the back as well. Uh, so Michael, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, just, just listening and reflecting, um, I was, uh, you know, the role of Planck's constant is fundamental in um, quantum mechanics. Um, but if it hadn't have been discovered um, experimentally, um, electron spin, hence Planck's constant, would have dropped out of Dirac's mathematics. So, so if Stern and Gerlach had not done their experiment, electron spin could be known as something like a Lorentz charge in uh, uh, units of um, H-bar. Um, now we're in the sort of quantum revolution 2.0, and we have these new phenomena like um, entanglement and um, you know, demonstrable um, uh, demonstrations of that. Do you think there's going to be any further links between um, uh, you know, new, the new phenomena of entanglement and, and the, the mathematical universe, the interplay of physics and mathematics? So you, there's two parts to that, because you started to about Planck's constant and then you segued into, into entanglement. Yes. And uh, I don't see the connection, but I can make... No, no, but well, there, there isn't, I'm, no, I'm saying... But I can, make, I can make a comment about the first, which is, yes, of course, uh, 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 counterfactually, anything could have been discovered in a number of ways because physics is multiply connected. And in particular, although as, as a historical fact, the quantization of spin came out of uh, uh, the Dirac equation, Several authors have pointed out that it's actually equally there if you, if you would consider the Schrodinger equation for several component particles. It's, it's the same thing with the same G factor, too, that you get, whatever. Feynman uh, noted that and, and, and others. I'm not quite sure what your question about entanglement is. I mean, it, although it's a central f ingredient in what you call 2.0, which I would rather state as the, the quantum physics where you directly manipulate individual quantum systems rather than ensembles of them, as in matter. But still, um, we, we, massive entanglement was already there for identical particles. Fermions and bosons are m beautifully, wonderfully, inevitably entangled. When I tell this to my quantum um, uh, information colleagues, they make the point, yes, but it's not a resource that you can use because it's there and you can't avoid it. So, but it's, it's always been there. But if your question was, is there anything new, fundamental, that would come out of that, how do we know? I mean, quantum, quantum mechanics does include it, but we know astonishingly little about the detailed quantum structure of the Hilbert space of more than two particles. It's really remarkable. We're just still at the beginning. We, we, there's even a question of what's the, how do you define a measure of entanglement? There are a number of them. Perhaps you need different ones for different purposes if you have more than two particles. But none of this is fundamental in the sense of going beyond quantum mechanics. It's beautiful quantum mechanics being explored, but I see no evidence that uh, there will be new beyond quantum physics, if that was what your, your question was. In, in fact, I was thinking more. Are the recent sort of phenomena from, uh, let's call it quantum mechanics 2.0, yes. um, is, is that going to lead the way to new mathematics? Oh, bound to. Don't know what it is, though. I mean, it's always the case. I mean, who would have thought that uh, number theory would play such a central role in uh, classical chaos as it does? 
And of course, in retrospect, it's obvious because to a mathematician, rational and irrational numbers correspond to what in physics are resonant and non-resonant. And that's obvious. But we didn't realize how much it would lead to. And now lots of mathematics uh, 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 we never anticipated being applied is. So, you know, difference between rational and irrational, you know, explain the gaps in the asteroid belt and so on. Um, so, yeah, but you can't know in advance. And I don't know. The answer is almost certainly there'll be new math. We know from string theory, regardless of it, whether it corresponds to the physical world or not, and, and, uh, and this is at the moment a matter of religion, um, you've certainly led to a lot of beautiful mathematics. So, uh, Thank you. Jim, Jim, the back Jim, Jim, the back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I need to get my head straight, Michael, before I give the summary talk after coffee. Um, you mentioned quite rightly that the, the Newtonian um, uh, classical world is not deterministic because there's no such thing as a truly isolated system unless we're talking about the entire universe. In, in quantum mechanics, that's even more important because you can't say anything about a quantum system unless you make some separation from its environment and trace over the environment and so on. Um, but you made a uh, you, you made a statement right at the very end where you said that these systems are not time reversal invariant, um, suggesting these are not, you know, you, you don't get, is the, the question is, do you get chaotic behavior in, in, in an isolated system? Is it possible? Uh, if it's isolated, it's unitary dynamics and it's time reversal invariant. So uh, is it, it uh, is time reversal invariance and irreversibility part of chaos because they, you don't see it unless it's an open system. Just to clarify, um, time, l l l lack of time reversal invariance here doesn't mean irreversibility, like in something like that. It means lack of time reversibility as when you have a magnetic field. You go around a circle, and, uh, and, and, and if you reverse a magnetic field, you don't retrace your steps. You go around a circle with the other chirality. So it's that. So we're still speaking about unitary evolution. And the difference is that when you look at the high excited states, they obey a different universality class of statistics. And that was well established in, 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 the, in the 1980s by taking these little model billiards and putting them in a magnetic field. In, so it's different from irreversibility. It's a different thing. But of course, your point about uh, non-isolation is exactly uh, the, the point I emphasize, which is that uh, you can't look at anything without doing something to it. And, uh, uh, and very often that involves something that you're not going to analyze precisely. Like nobody ever looks at all the detailed quantum mechanics of the bits of metal inside a, 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 inside a neutron interferometer or, 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 any, uh, or a Geiger counter or any piece of quantum machinery. Yeah. Questions? Uh, thank you for your talk. So, near the end of the, the talk, you mentioned that the distribution of the Riemann zeros are somehow related to a unknown quantum system. Uh, however, uh, given what you have discussed, we already know quite a lot about what this unknown quantum system looks like. So, um, I, I don't understand quantum mechanics very much, but I. I, I from what I understand, you can go from the Schrodinger equation to energy levels, and then if you know the energy levels, you can go back and construct a Hamiltonian with those energy levels. So can you do something similar and construct a s approximation to this unknown quantum system, and would that be something interesting to look at? Well, there's something called the Gelfand-Levitan procedure. That's a, a very restricted world, it says if you have a series of energy levels and that corresponds to the Schrodinger equation in one dimension with a potential, you can find that potential. When you try to do that with the Riemann zeros, you find that the more you include, the more wiggly and wobbly that potential becomes. In other words, it doesn't converge onto, uh, on, 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 onto an answer. You can find uh, uh, potentials 
uh, uh, it's kind of a trivial thing, uh, which give you the average density of the remises, but that ignores all the beautiful random matrix structure which is responsible for the fluctuations of the prime, so that doesn't help at all. Um, so this, those inverse methods don't work, and the reason is that uh, if this conjecture is right, it's certainly not just the Schrodinger equation with some potential. It's something more complicated, particles, uh, multi-component particles, Dirac equation, as I mentioned, or it could be that the unknown Hamiltonian, that's what determines a quantum system, is the sequence of a series of renormalization transmitters, and many possibilities beyond this simple Schrodinger, non-relativistic, which, which, sure, which is certainly not what the quantum system is that we're looking for. So those inverse methods don't, don't help. That's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. More questions? Yeah, question there. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Speaking about um, um, cosmology and the uh, chaos, anything about uh, chaotic inflation? Is there anything you can tell us? Thanks. Nothing I can say because I don't see any quantum. Oh, well, in the beginning, was this quantum field theory. But uh, the answer is no, I haven't thought about it in the context that I've been describing, so I, I, I can't comment. I don't know about, uh, the, 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 about what the classical limit would be of quantum inflation, but that leads me to identify a point, because uh, with, um, with chaotic inflation, this is a quantum field, right? Now, a quantum field has infinitely many degrees of freedom. So that means that in addition to small Planck's constant, you've got the other limit of many degrees of freedom. That's why there's a new subject being studied called many-body quantum chaos. So that's where, as well as Planck's constant being small and you get near classical, the number of particles also becomes large. That's a doubly singular limit. If you look in the plane of Planck's constant and one over the number of particles, the origin is gigantically singular. It depends on which direction you approach it. So that's being explored. I don't know if it's explored in the context of inflation, but you would need to. It's an additional level of singularity of limit. That's why these problems are so difficult mathematically. Yeah. Yeah. Why? If I dare to uh, say this with the utmost respect to philosophers here, these questions of relations between theories involve more than words. You, they involve mathematics, which is actually current and currently being developed. Hmm. Okay, any other questions? And if not, well, thanks very much for this beautiful. <laughs>